Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. And so I'm going to speak uh, from my experience uh, providing uh, legal advice to government about how to consult um, for, from someone who's done this for about 15 years. Uh, and, but that said, I need to say uh, that the views that I express in this presentation are my own and not necessarily of my, my employer, the province of British Columbia. So that aside. <laughs> so let me start first with giving you a little bit of context about the history in Canada. Uh, I will be focusing on the most western province, so that's British Columbia. That's where I'm from, Victoria. Um, so Canada, uh, you can see from this map that a large part of it, uh, historically in the 1700s and 1800s, there were just treaties signed. And so essentially the, the international customs of the time was that when European countries were exploring the seas and when they came across land that was already occupied by indigenous people uh, who had their own rules and, and practices and customs about how to make use of the land and resources, uh, they needed to enter into treaties before those European nations could settle and make use of the land. So that did happen through the East Coast, the Peace and Friendship Treaties, uh, and then into the sort of the interior uh, part of Canada there, we call those the number treaties from number one to number 11. In British Columbia though, uh, only the very top northeast corner, uh, there's some of the, the First Nations there that uh, has signed on to treaties and some just uh, close to Victoria on Vancouver Island. Uh, and so we have a, a unique situation in British Columbia uh, where today still there's, for the most part, there are not treaties signed for most of the 200 plus First Nations. There's 203 Indigenous communities, we call them First Nations or Aboriginal groups. Uh, so for the, the t most of the 203, they do not have treaties. Uh, and within British Columbia too, the 203 uh, groups, they're very diverse uh, from you know, the, the coastal groups to the interior, uh, to the ones who uh, you know, have the, the big mountains uh, in their territories, uh, the ones who make use of the, our, our rivers or the watersheds. There's a very large diversity in the cultures. There's about 34 language groups. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very interesting place in British Columbia. Um, so, here's just a, a closer view of our situation with treaties in BC. So again, most of the treaties occurred sort of close to Victoria, there are a few more up in the, on the island, and then that's Treaty 8 where a few of the, the First Nation groups signed on to, to that treaty. And then in more recent times, we have uh, these modern treaty agreements that took about 15 years to negotiate. Uh, and they're, just a few places here on the province with that. So let me take you to uh, an important part of the legal context in, in Canada, and that's this provision in the Constitution. It's Section 35, and it provides a, a recognition and affirmation of the Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. It's very brief, uh, and essentially it's been left up to the courts to interpret what this means. What is this constitutional protection for Aboriginal and treaty rights? Uh, and so it was through the courts after 1982, they developed the test for determining what can government do that constitutes an infringement on these constitutional protected rights. And if government are, is to infringe it, there may be some certain circumstances where that may be justified. But if government infringes on the right, it has to meet this high legal justification test in order to do that. So there's only so much government can do before it infringes on these constitutionally protected rights. And so it's also been left up to the courts to determine what is the test then for proving Aboriginal rights. I mean, it's clear when we have treaty rights, it's whatever the treaty says. So for example, on Vancouver Island or up in the Treaty 8 area, there's a treaty right to hunt, to trap, and to fish. But for the rest of British Columbia, where there are no treaties, we have these groups, these indigenous groups, who claim, they assert rights, these legal rights, uh, that flow from the fact that they were here when Europeans came. So the courts, they have set up a test for proving Aboriginal rights and this notion of Aboriginal title. So, for example, a very important case happened uh, about three years ago, uh, the Sokotin Nation, uh, they brought on this legal court case. It took about 15 years to get through the court system all the way to the highest court in land, which is the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, 
And that court gave a declaration that this group, they brought enough evidence to show that they uh, sufficiently and exclusively occupy a portion of their territory uh, at 1846, which is the time when the British Crown, they signed uh, the boundary agreement with the U.S. So that was the important date in British Columbia where this notion, this legal interest in land for Aboriginal groups in, in British Columbia, that's when it crystallized. So that's what Aboriginal groups have to bring evidence to court about, about how they made use of land at 1846. Mm -hmm. And this group succeeded in being able to prove that a portion of their territory, the dark green area, they got a court declaration that they have Aboriginal title to the land. And that is very significant because after that declaration, the Crown or the state no longer has jurisdiction over that land for a number of areas. It is the Aboriginal group, the Silcoteen Nation, they have the legal right to exclusively use and occupy the land. They are the ones who can make management decisions about how the land and resources will be used. And they also are the ones who can, they are entitled to the economic benefits of the land. So they own the trees. The courts also said that they would own the minerals. Uh, at issue, what caused this court case was that the Sokoti Nation, they were opposed to a number of the forestry activity that was occurring there. So part of this was their effort to control that or to stop that. Uh, so part of this decision, the court looked at uh, the province's forest act and saw that the forest act, the way it's written, it only applies to crown land, so state-owned land. It's no, after a title declaration, it is no longer crown land. So our Forest Act does not apply to that area anymore. So let me tell you about another important case, this uh, court case from 2004, again from our uh, highest court in the land, Supreme Court of Canada. This case was brought by the Haida Nation, which are, uh, they're located north of Vancouver Island there. And again, the issue here was forestry. Uh, there was a lot of clear-cutting occurring uh, within Haida Gwaii, their traditional territory. Uh, and at that time, government did not consult with them with a number of the forced uh, authorizations that were granted. And so they brought this case to court, and the Supreme Court of Canada uh, said to the government that even though the Haida Nation, they have not yet proven that they have rights or title to their territory, they do not have a treaty, but even though they only have these assertions of these legal rights, there is a legal duty on government to consult with them before we make decisions to authorize forestry on their territory. So this legal duty arises whenever government, the Crown, has knowledge, real or constructive, of the potential existence of Aboriginal rights or title and contemplates conduct that might adversely affect it. So that term of adverse effect the courts have since interpreted that as a low threshold. So it's the potential for there to be a negative impact. If there is that potential, this legal duty consult is triggered. Very similar to our legislation. Okay, mm -hmm. yes. So essentially what this means is that all of our land and resource decisions require consultation now. And even though one of the arguments the province had, the province had raised in this court decision was how can we possibly do that? We make hundreds, thousands of decisions each year in land and resource. How can we possibly consult with the 203 Aboriginal groups whose territories may be impacted by that? And the court had said, this is a constitutional obligation. It is not an excuse to not manage that, administratively manage that, because this is that important. Because what is at stake are these potential constitutional rights. So, the question usually isn't, is there a duty to consult? Because as I said, most of our land resource decisions will require consultation. The key question usually is, well, how much consultation then? And so here's a very simple diagram to capture what the Supreme Court of Canada had said, which is the scope or the depth of consultation is based on two key factors. So in British Columbia, because we have a lot of these asserted or claimed rights, the stronger the claim, the more information we have that indicates that that group, they would be able to make out Aboriginal title or meet the slightly different test for Aboriginal rights. The stronger the claim, the more consultation. And also another key one is how serious is the impact of this decision? The more serious the impact, the more consultation. The less impact, then less consultation, sort of perhaps notification. 
When I say notification, though, it's still before a decision is made. So following this court decision, the province did issue a, this consultation procedure. And this is a document that guides government officials when they are making land resource decisions. There are steps in here about how to consult with Indigenous groups who may be impacted. And so, for example, some key principles here uh, that you are to start early, as early as possible in the planning stage. Uh, and in saying that, uh, there was some discussion in our group yesterday about, well, you may not have all the information or the details early on. What do you consult about? But it's at this early planning stage that maybe some of the, the more uh, substantial design changes can occur. Because once a, a company or proponent you know, proposes something and they've invested a lot of money into the design, like where the tailing ponds is going to be, you know, where, how the walls of you know, the, the different components are going to be built, it may be hard to change the plans at that point, even if what they hear through consultation is that that's a really important area, that's going to have a serious impact. So earlier is better because there's more flexibility there. And then as you get more details, then you start sharing more of that details as you go through the process. It's a process. And in that process then, there's a requirement of government to share information about what is being proposed, the proposed project, the proposed activity, and also to pay attention to what we know of what are the Aboriginal interests, so the rights or the title or treaty rights that may be impacted. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, you know, for government staff, when we're sharing information, we try to make it as clear as possible, a clear map of this is where uh, this project is located. Try to use non-technical, plain language to try to explain that. Um, there's a number of sort of tools that government staff have to try to d develop sort of clear explanations of, of what is being proposed and how that might impact the Indigenous community, their exercise of rights. Um, and then finally, it's substance. It's more than just meetings or sending letters or phone calls. Uh, it's actually about what do you do about the concerns we hear? Uh, there's a lot of discussion about you know, having a meaningful influence on the decision making. Well, there is also this notion that the Supreme Court of Canada talked about of a legal duty to accommodate. That in some circumstances, if it becomes clear that there's gonna be an impact and perhaps even a serious impact uh, on perhaps a strong claim, Government needs to look at ways to avoid the impact, ways to minimize the impact, or if those are not possible, then is there some other way to address it, to offset it? We talked a little bit about, you know, maybe compensation, maybe some other offset like land swap. You know, maybe if, if the project can only be located there, maybe we can find other lands that are available for that group to use. So those are the kind of things that uh, this accommodation notion uh, can capture. And so I thought I would also show uh, this diagram. It's very hard for you to see, but let's see if we can make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so this is just a summary of the four stages in the, the province's consultation process, where there's first is a preparation phase. We look at information that, that the province currently has. So we have databases. We share information amongst different ministries of what we get from First Nations, what we hear from them. You know, if the forestry uh, um, authorities go and talk to them about this particular area, maybe that's the same area where uh, maybe it, perhaps this, uh, a road related to mine is also going through. So we share that information that's stored in a central place. So there's information then that government staff, they can review before they even start the con consultation. And through that review, they can figure out, well, who's best positioned to, to start this consultation? And I'll talk about that we can sometimes get the company to go and talk to the First Nation. Uh, maybe there's a number of agencies who have to make decisions. How do they coordinate that? Uh, determine who takes the lead. Um, and then they can also figure out, well, how serious is the project uh, impact going to be? Uh, and then you can gauge, well, how much you need to plan in terms of the consultation is at the lower level, or maybe you need to plan a much lengthier process to make sure we understand the impacts and make sure we properly explore what we have to do to accommodate for those impacts. And so that's, uh, so once you engage, you know, you, you provide, you know, some time to the First Nation. We talked a little bit of time in our group. Standard is probably 30 days. We give the First Nation about 30 days to respond. Uh, we follow up with a letter if we don't hear anything. Um, and even if they, the First Nations don't respond, and I'll, I'll get to this, there is an issue with capacity too. Uh, after the Haida decision, a lot of the communities, some of them maybe, you know, maybe a hundred or a couple hundred, some of them are larger, maybe a thousand or so, 
Um, but they got inundated by all these letters and referrals mm -hmm. and consultation packages for everything that occurs in their territory. So we know the capacity is a bit of an issue, and so we still the, the, the procedures say that even if you don't hear anything back from the group, you still have to carry on based on what we already know and think about, well, what can we do to try to avoid, minimize, or otherwise address potential impacts? And so that's this accommodation phase. Uh, that there needs to be consideration. Is accommodation required? Uh, if so, let's talk to the, f the, the group about it. Try to reach agreement. Try to come to consensus about what's required to address the impact. Um, and then once there's sort of a, an analysis of have we done enough, we think that there's been a meaningful process, we've addressed everything we can, then you move to the decision. Okay, so let me talk a little about the, the, the different relationships that are involved. So I'm mean, gonna use this term proponent, so that, that can be a, a company or an individual who proposes an activity or project. Uh, and so they make an application. Government, we adjudicate that. We make sure we have a fair, a timely, clear review process. But the duty to consult rests between the government and the First Nation or the Indigenous group. Mm -hmm. the, it is the government to government, or I think today we use the term nation to nation. Uh, that legal obligation rests with government, with the Crown. But in doing that, government can delegate certain components of consultation to the proponent. So, for example, in an environmental assessment process for the major projects, in the legislation, it allows the Environmental Assessment Office, so the agency running the EA review, they can delegate and direct the company to engage with the First Nation. So typically, they say that company, you need to develop a First Nation or an Aboriginal consultation plan. You need to talk to the Aboriginal groups about your plan, about how you're going to engage them throughout the process. They need to develop this plan in the pre-application stage, so early in the process. And then as part of that too, in, when they develop their application, when they finally submit their detailed application, that application needs to contain a lot of detail, not just about what the environmental impact is, or social, or health, or heritage effects, the other things that uh, the assessment office looks at. It also needs to include information about how this project is going to impact the Indigenous groups there. They need to talk to them, uh, and this is where uh, a lot of companies, they will find uh, what they call traditional use studies. So they will interview the communities, find out how the area is used for traditional practices, for hunting, fishing, gathering, trapping, other activities. That needs to be captured uh, and put into this application so that when government reviews it, we have that information. So they identify the impacts and they also identify what are the ways to avoid, minimize, or otherwise address that impact? So all of that, all that detail and discussion occurs between the proponent and the First Nation because government required that. Uh, there was a discussion yesterday about cumulative effects. As part of the environmental assessment in the legislation, part of the adverse effects that need to be reviewed in environmental assessment includes cumulative effects and it includes cumulative effects on the Indigenous group. So that is also part of what they need to include in their application before we start running that formal review process. So capacity funding. Uh, in the major project reviews, uh, there is standard capacity funding that government provides to the Aboriginal groups. Uh, but there is also quite a bit of funding that most companies will provide to groups as well. And there's a lot of uh, understanding, I think, that these are really intense processes, very technical. Uh, and particularly when we're dealing with these major projects, it is very useful for the First Nations to be able to hire their own consultants, uh, sometimes their own lawyers, to help them understand uh, the different documents and different processes and the opportunities they have to suggest different options. So, in major project reviews, there's quite a bit of capacity funding provided for the different groups. Um, the other component of the relationship between the proponent and the First Nation uh, is that there's a lot of encouragement for the company to understand what the concerns as well as the interests are of the, the community. And we encourage them to try to develop a good working relationship. Uh, and oftentimes that may result in a, sort of an impact benefit agreement. Uh, 
So recognizing if the project were to be approved, there are going to be impacts on the, the group. Uh, is there a way that the company can find to address those impacts through an offset, like a financial benefit, jobs, uh, training programs, uh, you know, sort of school scholarships, things like that. Uh, so that's left up to the company and the, and the, the Indigenous group to, to sort out. We also encourage a lot of early engagement, even before the application comes to, uh, or a project description comes to government, we encourage all companies, it is really important that you, you get to know and you develop a relationship with the Indigenous groups in that area. So uh, there's a number of documents and guidance documents the province has published to encourage proponents to engage uh, with Indigenous groups to help them understand why this is a legal requirement for government, how this can make a big difference for your proposed activity. Uh, so we have these two guides. Um, and even for the, the applications or activities that are not major project reviews, where perhaps the agencies, they don't have perhaps in their legislation the ability to direct a company to do things, there's still a lot of uh, language about, you know, we encourage you, we think this is in your best interest uh, to engage early and to work together with the, the Indigenous groups. Uh, and different industries, they've also published their own guides. So this one here is uh, published by the Mining Association. So again, a lot of explanation of why this is important and also some really practical tools about how you can engage. So the province, we've been doing this uh, quite a bit since that 2004 case of, of consulting. And over the years, I think we're getting better, a better understanding of, of what kind of impacts may occur on rights. Um, and so this greater sophistication of understanding what are the different components of rights and appreciating that it's more than just understanding the biophysical impact. So for example, a project that may impact, say, a wildlife herd. Say through our assessment, we determine with our biologists, it's a minor impact on that herd. Uh, we now today understand, well, that doesn't necessarily mean a minor impact on the Aboriginal treaty right to hunt that particular uh, wildlife species. Because there may be uh, other dimensions to it, that, for example, where that herd is or where this project is, that's a really important area for that group. They frequently go there, maybe because of close proximity to their village. Maybe they bring their, their your youth there every fall. They run a, a cultural camp to teach the traditions onto their youth. There may be sort of that uh, site-specific component uh, that may make that impact more than just minor. Uh, and there's also these cultural dimensions to it. You know, I mentioned sort of transferring knowledge from elders to youth. Uh, there may be some spiritual components to that particular area. So that's also another component of right that we, we need to pay attention to when we're asking the, the groups, well, how does this project impact you and your exercise of rights? So this is sort of a, a new analytical framework that we're, we're starting to apply, particularly on the major projects or where there's a lot of uh, contention, uh, disagreement about what might happen. And what we're finding is that Having this more holistic view and understanding of rights is really helping us understand better what do we need to accommodate for the impacts. If the impact is on sort of the sites or places, perhaps social, cultural, spiritual, experiential, then we can look at options to address that particular component. Uh, I mean, it's a lot easier uh, if it's the impact on biophysical, then you know, maybe we look at habitat protection or habitat compensation, uh, you know, ways to, you know, timing windows perhaps to uh, reduce the impact on the wildlife herd. So having that sort of deeper understanding of how rates may be impacted can really help us figure out what do we need to do to move forward. And so same thing with this notion, this legal notion of Aboriginal title, uh, which the courts have told us is made up of essentially these three general components, which is that there's a use and occupation, there's a decision-making component, and there's economic benefits. And so also with this holistic view, we can hone in on what are the impacts and how do we need to address that? So again, this notion of this legal duty to accommodate. Uh, the court had said that you know, where you've got the stronger claims that may be impacted in a significant way, government should be taking steps to try to avoid uh, that irreparable harm or to minimize the effects of the infringement. So here's just some examples from the, uh, the provincial consultation procedures of ideas to avoid, so timing windows, changing in the footprint of a project, uh, ways to minimize, uh, so maybe you could reduce the, the term of a permit so that the activities uh, are for a shorter time period. Um, other options could be monitoring, 
uh, maybe as a, a condition of the permit, there needs to be a monitoring. Maybe the, the Indigenous group needs to be part of that monitoring. Uh, and if certain thresholds are met through sort of an adaptive management, there's other steps that have to be taken then. Uh, maybe there's land use protections uh, and maybe even financial benefits, uh, particularly if we are in an area of a strong claim of title where, you know, on this slide, economic benefits is a component of title. So uh, I'll talk about some of the different kind of economic benefits that government provides as well as what companies provide. So why is this important for government to pay attention to? Well, there are very significant consequences if government does not meet the legal duty consult. So last year, I don't know if the news made it out here, but it was a very big deal in Canada. This oil pipeline, uh, it was uh, the Northern Gateway project uh, that has been undergoing uh, many years review, a lot of political pressure uh, and uh, political support for the project, uh, but the Federal Court of Appeal, they quashed the federal government's approvals at the EA, the environmental assessment stage. Uh, so that was quashed by the courts, and as a result now, that project is no longer going ahead. Mm -hmm. And so the reason for the quashing, government was found to have fulfilled their statutory requirements, it was a reasonable decision, but it was because they did not meet that legal duty to consult and accommodate with Indigenous groups, that was fatal to the project, to those approvals. And so the court gave a number of criticisms of how the federal government did not meaningfully engage, discuss, address the concerns raised by the Aboriginal communities, and for that reason said, if you want to go ahead, you have to address all of those defects. And so the government then decided they were not going to go ahead with this project. But this is a very uh, recent example of the importance of government meeting that obligation. And so just a little bit of explanation for the lawyers in the room. <laughs> in our Constitution, we have this provision that says the Constitution of Canada is the supreme law of Canada, and any law that is inconsistent uh, with the provisions of the Constitution is the extent of the inconsistency of no force or effect. This gives our courts the ability to oversee and supervise to some extent government decisions that may impact on constitutionally protected rights. And in those instances, they can, as we just saw, they can strike down decisions if we do not meet our constitutional obligations. So I'll give you a few more examples from the mining context. Um, this was a really big one for uh, in the province, and this deals with our northern caribou, which I think is probably the same as your, your reindeer, uh, probably different subspecies. Um, but there is a mining exploration program that was occurring in this area of uh, an important critical habitat for this herd of uh, this northern caribou, this burnt pine herd, of which there are only, I think, about 13 left in this particular herd. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, all, they're pretty much all there. <laughs> they're all tagged, they all have names. <laughs> um, it's a part of the context was that, you know, there's been different efforts to try to. Uh, deal with the, the species at risk status of the caribou, but government just had not gone up to this particular area yet, so there was no plan, there was no protection plan yet in place for caribou. And some of the protection measures that applied to forestry did not apply to mining activities. So what we had was this proposal for a bulk sample program, an exploration program, uh, and it was in the area of the Treaty 8 uh, communities, and it was an area where they hunted, Although, because the caribou are in such dire situation, our indigenous communities since the 1980s, they voluntarily stopped hunting the caribou. So then they looked at this exploration program and they said, by allowing this to happen, you are going to uh, irreparably destroy forevermore, essentially, or for a very long term, this important caribou habitat. And I'm sure you all understand you know, how long it takes to recover our caribou habitat. Uh, and so, there was consultation, uh, but the court in reviewing it said that it was not enough, it was not meaningful, and there was not meaningful accommodation. Uh, and so as a result of that, this exploration permit was suspended. Um, so that, this is one clear example where uh, the consultation was really criticized. Uh, one thing that the court uh, reiterated was cumulative effects. The fact that you know, there was only 13 left here was a, a result of a number of other activities that occurred in the area, oil and gas development, dams, roads, forestry. Uh, so this was sort of, we were already past the tipping point for uh, the caribou here. Uh, 
So it was important that government should have considered cumulative effects on the right to hunt, uh, and uh, government was found to not have done that, and so we uh, did not succeed either at the trial level or, or even at the BC Court of Appeal level, uh, and uh, we had to sort of do that consultation. This program actually, a new company bought it and they decided to stand down on this and focus on other projects in the area. Uh, here's another example of a mining exploration program. Uh, the company, they wanted to get some more information to support their environmental assessment of a, a major gold mine project in this area. Uh, this is, again, dealing with the Socotine Nation, but outside of the area where they have proven title. Um, and so they, there was consultation, uh, and, but the Socotine, they were uh, not satisfied with it. So after the permit was issued, allowing this exploration to occur, they challenged it in court. Uh, there's an ability to obtain uh, an interim injunction that stops uh, the company from moving forward uh, with any of the activities until the court can hear. Uh, the, the full hearing of, of the permit and the consultation process, that injunction was granted. Uh, and even though there's a lot of evidence in the mining company about the thousands, uh, uh, I think even millions of dollars that was going to be sacrificed if there was a delay because they had rented all the equipment, they had you know, secured all the contracts to move ahead. But the court said, well, the minerals, they're not going anywhere. Uh, it's important for government to make sure that they meet their constitutional obligation to consult. Uh, and so suspended uh, the, uh, that permit uh, and so there didn't need to be another hearing of it because in the meantime the, the parties negotiated a settlement uh, and the company went forward with a reduced exploration plan and then when they went to the, the federal environmental assessment process the federal government actually turned down the project and said no. Finally I wanted to just raise this example of legislation and so this is not from BC uh, it's from um, the Yukon, which is just north of BC, um, but there's some similarities uh, to BC that uh, causes BC to have a little bit of concern when, we, when this came out. So in the Yukon, similar to BC, there is this free entry mining regime. So uh, companies, individuals, to go and stake your claim uh, in BC, it's just an online website program. You can just identify the area, submit your I think it's $20 of a fee, and then there you go, you have the, the mineral claims, you have the exclusive right to explore that area. So Yukon has a similar sort of this free entry mineral claim staking program um, that it's a sort of a, an automatic process. There's no opportunity for consultation because there's no decision point. Mm -hmm. The decisions come when uh, you want to do a certain kind of exploration program, and then if you want to go forward with a you know, full blown out mine, then then there's a lot more uh, permit and decisions and leases and other kind of higher levels of tenures that the company can apply for. But at this very early stage of just staking a claim, there is no decision and therefore no consultation. Uh, and in the Yukon context, with your staked claim, you can actually go forth and start doing some exploration activities, uh, mechanized activities. And so the court had said, the Yukon Court of Appeal, which is actually our BC judges, uh, they said statutory regimes that do not allow for consultation and fail to provide any other equally effective means to acknowledge and accommodate optional claims are defective and cannot be allowed to subsist. So court found that the Yukon uh, had a duty to consult with the First Nation uh, before they were to make the mineral rights available to third parties. They were also supposed to consult before allowing those exploration activities to occur that was not the case, uh, and so the Yukon was given one year <laughs> to deal with this uh, situation, and within that year, they changed the legislation. So this is an example where the Constitution, that provision, Section 52, mm -hmm. a court can find that legislation is in unconstitutional. So let me just talk about consultation at the deep end. So major projects like mines, those would be considered uh, projects that could have a serious effect, which according to the simple diagram, you would be at that deep end of consultation. And so what the Supreme Court of Canada said at that deep end, it's aimed at finding a satisfactory interim solution. So government is trying to reach agreement then about how the project should or perhaps should not go ahead. Um, it may entail the opportunity to make submissions for consideration, formal participation in the decision-making process, providing written reasons mm. to show how their concerns were considered yes. <laughs> and to reveal the impact they had on the decision. Mm. 
So for example, in the EA process environment assessment, uh, the Aboriginal groups, they are part of the, the working group, the formal working group with other ministry uh, agencies, with the company. Uh, they uh, have the ability to um, provide a submission directly to the decision maker. And then the decision maker typically will write a rationale documents saying, in making this decision, this is what I considered. This is how I considered the impact on Aboriginal or treaty rights. And this is how I thought that it was or what was not adequately addressed. So it's very clear that our decision maker put his or her mind to these very issues. But it's really important to highlight this, uh, which is a little bit contentious, um, that the Supreme Court of Canada described this duty to consult or duty to accommodate. It's a process that does not give Aboriginal groups a veto over what can be done with land pending proof of claim. The Aboriginal consent spoken of in one of the early cases, Dalgamook, is appropriate only in cases of established rights and then by no means in every case. So concretely what this means is that the Sokoti Nation, they have an established Aboriginal title right. In that area, before government can do anything, any land or resource decision, they have to seek the consent of the Sokoti Nation in that proven title area. That's the circumstance where consent uh, is required, is legally required. And if government doesn't get the consent of the Aboriginal group, uh, that very legal high uh, justification test needs to be met by government before they could proceed. So how this is uh, playing out in some of the, the environmental assessments today, uh, we've been trying to improve uh, how we consult. We've been hearing criticisms of you know, the process. Sometimes it's not meaningful. It doesn't give the influence that First Nations think that they should have. So the environmental assessment office in the last a uh, little while, has been developing this notion of collaboration. To, uh, we use this metaphor of bringing the Aboriginal group to our side of the table, mm -hmm. you know, that we are partners in the review process, uh, that we are trying to seek consensus on what are the impacts of the project on their Aboriginal or treaty rights, and what kind of accommodations are required. And we collaborate then on the development of draft conditions, so if a certificate is issued for the project, we work together to figure out well, what are the terms and condition for that certificate then, those legally binding terms on the company. Uh, we all agree, uh, we share the objectives of having a timely, effective participation. The process should be fair, clear, neutrally administered. Uh, it should be transparent, it should be predictable. And recognizing that uh, you know, these major projects, this is an area for a lot of contention, there will be disagreements. So we agree up front, how are we gonna resolve those disagreements? So we build in processes to try to resolve those uh, differing points of views and disagreements. So one example of how this played out uh, in a recent approval for this mine, this is a Kames underground mine. Uh, and this was a project that in 2007, uh, it was rejected, it was turned down by government because it was in a, a culturally important area for these indigenous communities. Uh, so a new company then bought the project and uh, starting in 2011, they started to collaborate. They worked very closely with those communities who were affected. And then they redesigned the project. So now it was an underground mine. Uh, and then by the time it came to government, government also offered up collaboration. We signed a collaboration plan, agreeing what the pr key principles were, what the different steps were throughout the process, what role they were gonna have. And as a result of that then, uh, we collaboratively dr drafted the assessment report, that portion about how the project was gonna impact on them. Uh, we collaborated on the methodology of how we were gonna assess the project impacts on their rights and title interests. And we came to consensus, and this is reflected in the assessment report, we all agreed that the measures to mitigate the impacts on the rights and title interests were satisfied, that we had done an adequate job at this EA stage, recognizing there are still a number of permits that were required where you get into more detail, and there was a commitment from those agencies, the Ministry of Mines, uh, that they were also gonna collaborate. So with that comfort that there was gonna be ongoing collaboration if, even after the EA, the company was also committed to the collaboration. The province, the government had also offered up to the, the community, recognizing that if this project goes ahead, there are gonna be impacts, that even with an underground mine, you can't avoid all the impacts still. So recognizing that there were offset measures. So with all of our major mines, we offer up revenue sharing to the indigenous communities who, who are gonna be impacted. Uh, so it's about a third of the, the 
the royalty revenues and the mineral royalty that uh, government gets. So that, that is shared with the First Nations there. Uh, and the company also had a number of uh, economic benefits that would flow to the, the community. So what are the percentages of the benefit sharing? Who are the representatives? So what are the percentages? Uh, Did you say the percentage is a third. Yeah, but, but how is a third of what? what? What sums are we talking about? Oh, it depends on the mine. I, I can't remember offhand how much that results in for this particular mine, but it, it can be substantial. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's part of the decision-making process, recognizing that the Indigenous community, they make a decision for, on behalf of their community. Government, we make a decision based on our re regulations, legislation, uh, you know, administrative law, and we hope that through this collaboration, we end up at the same place. Uh, so we got a letter of support, a formal letter written by the community saying that they supported the approval of this project at the EA stage because of all the things that had occurred and all the legally binding terms that were attached to the certificate. Uh, and then so as a result, on May, March 8th, 2017, uh, an EA certificate was issued for this project. So that's our most recent success story of uh, a, a consultation accommodation process which all parties agreed was effective. So I'm just going to close with a uh, little bit of context of uh, this notion of reconciliation, both in BC and Canada. Uh, so following that high the decision 2004, 2004, uh, government entered into this new relationship vision document, uh, recognizing that there was a paradigm shift now, that prior to 2004, there was no legal obligation on government to consult and accommodate uh, Aboriginal groups before making land and resource decisions. And so that then inspired sort of this political uh, vision of a new relationship, this government-to-government -go -government relationship that was based on respect, recognition, and accommodation of Aboriginal rights and title. Uh, this also led to the signing of this transformative change accord that was to try to address, uh, there's a, a fairly significant gap between the socioeconomic conditions of our Aboriginal groups with non-Aboriginals uh, in British Columbia and Canada generally. There is also a number of agreements that government has been signing with different uh, groups. Uh, we have been talking with them and, and working with them over the years to find out what are more effective ways in consulting and engaging on these decisions. Are there ways that we can engage on the more strategic decisions rather than the individual transactions? Can we agree on you know, general principles about how you know, certain areas are going to be used so that all those little other decisions, we don't have to spend any time or much time on those. So we have a number of these strategic engagement agreements. And through those, uh, there was sort of a policy that you know, we were going to try to group up uh, a number of the different Aboriginal groups uh, so that you're not dealing with, we, so we don't need 203 different agreements to try to group them up together uh, based on how they wanted to organize. And so in that context where there has been this grouping, there's capacity funding provided to those groups to help them process all these uh, consultation referrals. Uh, we also have, uh, with the Treaty First Nations, those ones that have signed those modern treaties, uh, the treaty provides a commitment that, uh, sure, government, we can continue to make uh, use, authorizing uses and dispositions of land and resources, but it's subject to us not denying the First Nation the reasonable opportunity to continue to hunt or gather within their treaty harvest areas. So there's this notion of reasonable opportunity that you can only go so far before there's no more reasonable opportunity for them to exercise their traditional activities. And so we've been negotiating agreements with uh, those First Nations about, well, how do you determine what is a reasonable opportunity? And again, this, whole, this notion of trying to understand at a sort of broader landscape level, what are the indicators that would support a reasonable harvest of particular species? Uh, information sharing, setting up uh, annual meetings then with that group of you know, sharing information about natural resource management. Uh, the First Nation can share information about uh, how they're harvesting, where they're harvesting, uh, how their success rate is like. Um, we have sort of uh, an ability to monitor, so maybe sharing information of uh, monitoring together and figuring out together what it is that we should be monitoring in the first place. Uh, and then for one of these groups, we have this notion of important harvest area that it's in these areas that the First Nation identified as this is the important area where they hunt or fish or gather. There's certain significant decisions that we've identified in the list that those are the ones that we're going to consult on. Those are the ones that we're going to spend our time and energy getting into, you know, the information sharing, figuring out how to accommodate. Uh, 
but for the rest of the other decisions, the transactional ones, we can let those go. So this is a way to be more efficient and to try to be more strategic. Um, here's a number of other revenue sharing agreements the province has with the Indigenous groups. So we share revenues on forestry, mining, I talked about resorts, uh, and also clean energy uh, initiatives. We also have reconciliation agreements, uh, which can sort of cover a broader range of things, including how we're going to consult. So one of them, I, I know there's some discussion of land use plans. So there's one where government worked together with uh, the Aboriginal group and sort of determined, you know, from a landscape basis throughout their territory, areas that were suitable for different activities, including certain areas that were going to be no-go zones. And because government was part of that process, you know, you know, we could balance the different interests that we were aware of, and we could also use legal measures to carve out those areas of no-go zones so that it would be taken out of sort of, you know, the land registry or there'd be certain notations put on it for a certain period of time. So that's another example of trying to be more strategic and that so decisions we make after that, we can look at well, what did the land use plan say about this kind of activity here. So finally, I also wanted to paint a bigger picture of what's going on in Canada. Uh, we have just recently gone through a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, Canada, uh, and similar to other Commonwealth countries, there was a, a time in our history where uh, the children of Indigenous communities were taken from their homes and they were required to attend these schools run by churches and, and government, uh, and they were prohibited from speaking their own language, practicing their own culture, uh, there were abuses that occurred, and so through this Truth and Reconciliation Commission from 2007 to 2015, uh, there was sort of this nationwide uh, effort to make sure all Canadians knew of this history, that we were all part of this storytelling effort to understand, because for a long time, a lot of people were not aware that this was occurring. The last residential school closed, I think, in the 1970s, 80s, so it's not that long ago. Uh, and the, the legacy of that, we still continue to see uh, how that continues to have significant impacts on, on our Indigenous peoples. So there's a lot of recommendations that came out from this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, uh, and I think that has shifted our national consciousness around these issues, as well as judges are paying a lot more attention to how historic government policies uh, may have uh, affected these communities and may also affect their ability to prove out rights and title if you know maybe they haven't been there for a certain number of years because of their you know relocation or whatnot so there's there's more emphasis governments are paying more attention to it uh, in recent elections uh, we're hearing more and more this notion of reconciliation and indigenous issues have uh, increased in profile I would say uh, for for a lot of Canadians uh, and in 2016, uh, the federal government, they announced their full support for the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We were one of, I think, three countries in the world who uh, did not sign on to it originally, uh, and then said that, well, we would sign on to it, but we really, we had some significant concerns about a few key provisions about free prior informed consent. <laughs> But now the government, we have removed those qualifications uh, placed by previous government. Uh, and they've also recently announced that there's going to be this federal working group of ministers to review all the laws and policies related to Indigenous peoples. Uh, they're going to run this review uh, with the objective to ensure that the Crown is meeting its constitutional obligations, including adhering to the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples, and to support the implementation of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, their recommendations. So we'll see where the federal government land on this, but that, that's fairly significant. There was discussion yesterday about, you know, let's not touch the laws, but here we have a government saying, well, let's look at our laws. Let's see what needs to change. Uh, and then finally, uh, actually, while uh, uh, Kaiser Rasmus and us, uh, we were in Montreal, the federal minister came to our conference and made this announcement about uh, the conclusion of this expert panel report uh, that was reviewing the environmental assessment process. They had gone across the country to hear different concerns and complaints about how our EA process was being run, uh, and there's a large emphasis about Indigenous communities and their meaningful participation in these processes. So that panel made a number of recommendations about how Indigenous communities could be more included uh, at all stages of the EA uh, in accordance with their own laws and customs. So we're waiting to see how that's going to translate into uh, concrete measures. So, with that, 
<laughs> Tax so my cat. <laughs>